<laughs> All right, hi everybody, good stuff. So welcome back, hopefully you got some pizza and uh, I don't know, what else did they have over there? Did you, did you get pizza? I didn't even think about it. I just got coffee, I'm, the jet lag's uh, intense. Okay, so uh, who was here when I was, I was just here like a, like a month and a half ago or two. Who saw me last time? Okay, good. So we're not going to do all of that again. Uh, and there's just been a few things uh, that have sort of dropped in the meantime, you know. Uh, so I figured we'll do a very short, we don't have a lot of time. And, uh, and, you know, there's only a few things anyway. So I figured we'll just talk about those new things, okay. Uh, and, uh, you know, these are all things that I think will serve us well. Uh, but basically my core thesis, the, uh, my, my, the thing I've just been so excited about is I, I, I truly believe there's never been a better time to be a Java developer. Java is now uh, paradigmatically more important than ever, and Spring Boot is more useful and more profoundly powerful than ever. And that's just more manifest uh, uh, in these new versions of Java and the new versions of Spring Boot. And so, uh, obviously, um, you know, you saw Java 19, sorry, Java 21 just came out on the 19th, right? Uh, and, uh, and Spring Boot 3.2 is coming out later this year. So it's an amazing time, a lot of amazing opportunities. So we're going to go ahead and just see all these things in action. We're going to go to my second favorite place here on the internet. Obviously, uh, can you want to turn off the lights? Can you see the screen? Is it too bright? Um, I could do this, but that's, that feels wrong. There you go. There you go. Good stuff. So there you go. There you go. So, um, so we're going to build a new application. Friends, I'm going to, start to, I'm going to go to start.spring.io. Build a new application. I'm going to use Maven uh, because right now Gradle is a little weird with Java 21. Um, it'll get fixed. When it, I think they're blocked by Kotlin supporting Java 21. And so in theory, maybe that's like fixed by the end of October. In the meantime, Maven it is. No big deal. Uh, we're going to build a new service. Obviously, we're going to build a new application. Uh, I'm going to call this service. I'm going to call the service service. And the reason I'm going to call it service is because I am great with names really good with names. I get that from my father. I told you about this, right? My, my father was great with names. When I was a boy, we had a small white dog, and my father named him White Dog. Now, <laughs> now this, this little dog, he, he was with us for like 10 years, and then he disappeared. I don't know what happened to him. I think he got a job. Anyway, like, uh, eventually another small white dog appeared at our door, and my father named him Two. And I'm not sure if it's T-O-O -O or T-W-O, but either way, my mom, she tells me all the time, you're very lucky that I named you. And I think that's probably, that's probably true. Okay, so we're going to use Java 21, my friends. Now, you might notice that here, we have four different versions of Java that we could select. Uh, Java's 21, 17, 11, and 8. Friends, you have to use Java 17 or later with Spring Framework uh, 6 and Spring Boot 3 or later, okay? So these other radio boxes, these are just for the memes, just for the just for the joke. They're just to find out who makes terrible life decisions. These should never, ever be selected, ever, in any context, okay? These are completely inappropriate in every single situation. So, uh, you know, I, I, I hope you don't need to be persuaded that Java 17 and later are amazing boss sauce pieces of software, and they are much, much better. They're faster, more performant, more syntax rich, more robust, more secure than Java 8 in every single way. They're technically superior in every single way. They're also morally superior in every single way. You won't like the look of sadness and shame and disgust in your children's eyes when they find out you're using Java 8 in production. Don't do it. Be the change you want to see in the world. Do the right thing. And friends, if you're not already persuaded, then I think it's inarguable that Java 21 is almost, if you just judge by the, by the version number alone, Java 21 is almost three times better than Java 8, okay? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it at Java 21. We have some, we're going to add some dependencies here. Not a lot, just a few, okay? Uh, we're going to add the uh, test container support. We're going to add Postgres. We're going to add the GraalVM native image support. We're going to add uh, the dev tool support. Uh, we're going to add the web support, maybe? Yeah, sure, why not? And, um, and that's about it, I think. Postgres, uh, I've got JDBC, do I? Uh, no, I don't have JDBC in there. Bring that in there, okay? Good, okay. So we're going to build a new application. I'm going to go ahead and hit generate, and we're going to open this up in our IDE. Uh, I did the wrong thing. I chose 3.14. We're going to use the milestones for uh, the new version of Spring Boot. Again, due out in November. OK, here we are. OK, very good. By the way, your Wi-Fi here, fantastic. Great stuff. I downloaded four gigabytes while the good doctor was talking. Uh, I downloaded Xcode, basically. It was amazing. Like, well done. Well done. Okay, so 
brand new application. I want to just talk about a few things here, friends. Uh, this is a brand new application. Um, I'm going to build an application, and I'm going to have a, a domain model, right? And normally, you know, when I talk about to, to people about this kind of stuff, I use records. I love records, right? Records are a great way to model sort of ephemeral state data in a program, right? And I, I just think they're just a, a much better way to think about building and modeling software. But now with Java 21, and by the way, can you, is that, should I, is that theme okay? Or like I can change the theme, okay? So maybe, maybe it's too dark. Uh, we could, we could do uh, like um, uh, light mode like that. Is that better, right? Or my new favorite mode, of course, is the Barbie mode. Um, <laughs> So I'm, I, who saw that movie? It's amazing. Go see it if you have not. Oh, so good. Uh, so who, Barbie? Okay. Uh, light, light mode. Who prefers light mode? Boo, right, okay, Barbie it is. Let's go. So here we go. So we've got, this, uh, we've got this new type, right? I've got this type here called uh, customer, and I'm using a record. Records are great, and they've been there since Java 17, but they enjoy a synergy in Java 21. And I want to talk about some of those amazing features. This, uh, Java 21 supports what's called data-oriented programming. This is what uh, Java language architect Brian Getz has been calling it, right? He wrote a great article uh, in InfoQ last year talking about data-oriented programming. And, and there's just really, it's a confluence of a bunch of features that have been slowly added to Java that now culminate in this new release. So let's say I've got this type here, I've got a customer, but you know, let's just let's take a step back here for a second, okay? Uh, let's just take a simple step back and, and just kind of look at uh, some of the unique opportunities here, some of the ways that these things play together. First of all, there's records. You saw records, right? I've got a record here uh, like this. If I go here, I've got a, a record, integer ID, string name, and when I use that class, if I use that type, I have an object that has a, um, a two string equals hash code, etc. It's an object whose identity is tied to the components of the object. Okay? This is like uh, what you would have gotten if you had used at data with Lombok before. right? And the reason you, would, you want something like this, the reason a convenience like this is useful, is because increasingly our code bases are getting smaller and we're dealing not with API bounds, but, inter but more data, right? The data is the way we think about interacting with other parts uh, of the system. It's not the methods and the, uh, the shape of the API itself. Uh, Brian Getz makes the great point that historically Java has been amazing, absolutely amazing, for large code bases because it has great, sec great protections for uh, security boundaries, for API boundaries, for uh, object boundaries, and so on. It's great at cordoning off parts of your domain model and your object graph. Uh, and making it so that you have a very clear idea of what the shape of those things are. And that it makes it great in the monolith, right? The large code bases with lots of moving parts. Java has thrived there. No wonder it was uh, so successful in that context. But increasingly, we're dealing with small code bases. And we're dealing with lots of ad hoc data, data you know, coming in from the network, from Kafka, from HTTP, et cetera. And uh, we're not dealing with large code bases with lots of moving parts. The, the way we inter interact with other parts of the code is in terms of objects that we send back and forth. So having that be front and center, to be able to support data-oriented programming is very important. So this is the first part of that, okay? The ability to have a record. This gives you the ability to have a nice, clean understanding of what the type, uh, of, of what the object is and what the component parts of that is. The next feature that works really well in this new context is the new switch expression. How many of you have tried this? The switch expression, the smart switch, whatever you want to call it, right? We have the switch statement before, and I didn't really use the switch statement because, frankly, it was just too much of a pain in the in the in the in the uh, po posterior. Yeah, yeah. It, like it's just too complicated. It, you have too many. Um, it's too fraught. Too many ways to hurt yourself, right? You have the if you miss a break statement, you go through the drop through. You don't know what the state's going to be. It doesn't really buy you anything, and now you're you know. If you're using object-oriented de design, there's also other patterns that would seem to be a little bit cleaner, like the, like the, the strategy pattern or the visitor pattern. A lot of ways to like, visit a lot of different uh, implementations across a particular object and see which one matches, right? So, but now we have the switch expression. So let's say I, um, I have an enum, okay? Let's say I have a, uh, a variable, okay? Var day of week equals day of week dot Friday. Okay, so I want to see, I want to, and then I want to like print out a message in response 
to that variable coming into my, my method. I don't know what the value is though, so I'm going to use a switch. I'll say day of week, okay? I'm assigning a value. The switch actually can return a value now. It's an, it's an expression. And you can see the compiler's already helping me out. It's saying, hey, it doesn't have any case clauses. Fair enough. So I say case Friday, okay? Um, or wait, uh, Monday. Here we go. Monday, right? And what do I want to do if it's Monday? Well, I can say, uh, you know, it's, uh, I don't know, Monday, right? Fine. Uh, what about Tuesday? All right, Tuesday, etc. So I can just keep doing this. And obviously, I can also put them together. So Tuesday, Wednesday, happy days. Come, come on. Oh, am I the only one who watched that show? Uh, so, okay, you can, you can merge these branches together. Uh, but, you know, either way, uh, let's see, if I, let's say if I just tried to leave it at that, okay, Thursday, okay, um, what happens? The compiler says, no, this hasn't caught everything yet. You don't get this with the switch statement. The compiler is telling me, you haven't covered all the possible input values. So I've got exhaust, I've got exhaustive checking, right? Exhaustive, exhaustion, there you go, I've got exhaustion checking. It's, it's making sure that I've exhausted all possible paths. And this is a compiler feature looking out for me. You didn't get this with the switch statement, right? It would just let you happily handle three cases and then ignore the others, right? If you want to, if you, were, if you remembered, you'd have a default fall through case, but it's up to you. You can have poorly written code and it didn't care. Now the compiler's on your side. It wants you to get this right. And it knows that since it's an enum, there's only a finite set of range of, of values in that object that you can handle. So therefore, it'll help you to remember to do that. So okay, Monday, Okay, okay, sure. Let's just go through the motions here. Tuesday, uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. and I know I could just do dot name, but let's just imagine I'm doing something useful here. Wednesday, right? Wednesday, Thursday, we got Thursday. We went Friday, okay, Friday, and uh, whatever, Friday, and then Saturday. Okay, and I could do a default, by the way. I could do this like, uh, Sunday, right? I don't know, whatever. I could do that, or I could just cap, you know, handle the Sunday, and I just do it like that as well. So Sunday, uh, very good. So now I've got, I've, I've handled all the cases, and the compiler has helped me out. It knows that I've handled all the cases. If I get rid of that, it complains. I haven't handled all the cases. So now I've got a switch expression, very clean. I get the res result. I can then print it out, right? It's whatever, right? There's the day of week. So day of week. Okay, that kind of thing. Now, oh, yeah, no, hey, what happened? Oh, it's a uh, I, I, uh, message for day of week. Okay, very good. So the switch expression is really, really powerful. Um, now, where else can I use the switch expression, right? I, it, it really benefits us if we have a, a, a finite set of states. Well, another new feature that was introduced in Java is sealed types. Okay, now sealed types in Java 17 didn't really buy you a lot, but it really comes into its own when you use it in conjunction with the switch statement, okay? So a, a, a sealed type is, let's say I have the, you know, uh, you, know you can imagine this um, very boring hierarchy, right? Interface animal, right? Okay, very good. Uh, and I want to have a cat, and it's going to implement animal, and I've got another one here, dog, implements animal, and what do cats do? They uh, meow, right? Okay. So let's see, string meow, return meow. And then what do dogs do? Well, dogs bark, yeah, exactly, woof. So there you go, we got, I wanna like have a way to handle getting the message from these different cats, right? different animals, right? These, and I could use, I could just have a generic forced sort of uh, method here called talk or communicate or something, but I don't really need to. I just have a, only a few types and they all have their own particular uh, structure, so it's okay to respect that. But I want the compiler to help me iterate over these possible values. So I'm going to say var, uh, you know, var message, uh, I'm, I'll do message equals switch, and I've got an object, okay, var uh, um, uh, Felix equals new cat, okay, and um, I'm going to pass this in. So, I'll, you know, let's just say it's, a, it's an object here. Okay, I'm going to imagine this is a method and I'm just passing in an object. The compiler doesn't know. Okay, so I've got now this object. Um, oh, sorry, it's an animal. There you go, animal. Okay, I've got this object of type 
uh, I've got this object I'm passing in. I want to get the message and then return that here. I want to get. I want to talk to the creator and get the response from there. So I say case, cat. Okay. This is the first instance of pattern matching in the new language. I'm using a pattern match to say, test if this is a cat, and if it is, assign it to a local variable, and then call meow on that variable. But also, notice that it's, 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 it's saying you don't have a default expression, right? You don't, it doesn't know what all the input values are, but it knows I don't have all the, uh, the uh, I, it knows I, I need to do something better. So I want to give it an explicit knowledge of what all the possible values are. And the way I can do that is by making this type sealed. Right? So I, now I'm saying this type only allows two particular subclasses, cat and dog. And so now these types either must be also sealed and permit subclasses, or they must be uh, final. Okay? So implements animal. Uh, local classes must not extend sealed. Okay, yeah, fair enough. This doesn't, you can't put it inside, the, inside of a method there, okay? There. So now I've got um, these types. Okay, uh, cannot be referenced from a static context. Wait, come on. Okay, static. Static. Good. Not good. Good, okay? So now I've got this. Now what? Now the system is saying uh, it doesn't cover all possible input values. So it's saying, okay, You've got an animal, but there are two different animals you need to care about, dogs and cats, right? And so uh, it'll, it'll, it'll complain if I don't do the right thing there, okay? So the compiler is now helping me catch a, a bad, a, 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 an implementation of, a, of, of the types of the algorithm that doesn't cover all the possible cases. So if you're building something highly algorithmic, something very complicated, something where you've got regulatory or whatever, you want the compiler catching these possible states. Imagine you're building a system modeling different kinds of loans and taxes and all that kind of stuff. You don't want this, to, this is not like a framework. You're not, you don't want this to be open-ended. You want to know that you've covered every single case in every single instance. You want the compiler to complain when you add a new type of loan to the hierarchy and you've got some logic buried away in some method around you know, calculating tax or whatever that you haven't covered. Now you've got that. The compiler has your back. And a big part of that is this pattern matching. Okay? You've seen this pattern matching before, right? Uh, you've probably seen the new smart instance of, right? I can actually go back over here. I can say, uh, if Felix instance of cat C, right? So that in, I don't have to downcast. I can now call c.meow inside of that if block. I'm using that smart, uh, smart instance of uh, check there, okay? That's, in the, that's possible now in this. Well, okay, what if, what if, um, what if these are records, right? So public final, public record, right? String name, okay? Public record, uh, static record cat, string name, right? Implements animal, okay? Um, so now I've got, you know, these are uh, records. They have co they have components. And maybe I don't want to, maybe I want to like, maybe I don't want to get the method. Maybe I just want to do something with the component fields. Well, now, do you know there's a nested pattern matching? So I can actually say that I want to match cat. I want to match dog. And, you know, um, whatever, the name of the dog is name. See that? It extracted out the component field of this record. So I'm matching the type and I'm saying if it matches, then there's a, a component field in the record, extract it out, hoist it out into a variable, and then allow me to reference it, okay? This is the kind of stuff you could do in Scala, right? This is very, very powerful for Java. I mean, it's really powerful for any language, but the fact that it's now here is just wonderful. So, okay, so uh, the name of the cat is whatever, name, okay? Okay, so I've got now a smart pattern matching. Oh, here, I got a like, Felix, there you go. Okay, so the name of the cat, the name of the dog. So let's see what the message is. If I run this program, what do I get? Do, do, do. Oh, I got the wrong variable there, that's for sure. Uh, message. Run that again. Okay. There you go, Felix. See what I'm saying? So all this is, oh, you know what? I'm going to, I just realized the Barbie theme doesn't capture, it's not making it clear when I have uh, uh, an error. So here we go. Wake up. Good stuff. 
So there we go. The, the, the compiler working together with all these things enables a whole new paradigm, data-oriented programming, okay? I really like this stuff. This is like very, very interesting now. Suddenly, using the switch statement doesn't feel so dirty. Sometime, suddenly, I don't need to have a strategy pattern just to like handle a, a, a number of potential states or implementations to iterate over possible range uh, of values. So this is one thing that's really, really powerful, and it's enabled by the lowly record, which, which we just looked at, okay? So okay, good. Now you understand that. Let's go back to our regularly scheduled Spring Boot application. Uh, spring application dot run, service application dot class, args, good. The next thing, I've got an application here. Uh, and the application is just your regular Spring Boot application. So we'll create a record and we'll say integer ID string name. Okay, and it's just going to be a Spring Data record, right? And I'm going to create a repository here, customer repository, extends list of CRUD repository managing instances of type customer whose primary key is a type integer. Uh, and now I want to use that. And of course, uh, this is pretty straightforward. I can create an HTTP controller, for example, like so. Pretty stock standard stuff. So customer HTTP controller, uh, create an endpoint, get mapping, customers, collection, customer, blah, blah, blah. You know, just, you've seen this kind of stuff before, right? So private, final, customer, repository, repository. Voila. Okay. And this dot repository dot find all. Very good. So there's my simple HTTP endpoint. I'm going to be using a database, obviously. So I'll go uh, here. I'll say initialize the SQL database. And then I'm going to create a SQL file here just to have some data with which to work. So I'll go back here. Okay. New file called schema.sql. Create table if not exists. Customer ID serial primary key name var car 255. Same old, same old. Okay. There you go. Good. Now, uh, I want to have some sample data, so I'll go here and I'll say data.sql, uh, delete from customer, insert into customer, name, values, uh, and you know, I've got the great Dr. Sire, I've got Michael, and uh, me, and whatever. Okay, good. Whatever, just three's a crowd. Okay, good. So we've got our data. Now I, I'm going to run this in the, I'm going to store this in a database, right? Well, I don't want to have a, a long wiki page with 500 easy steps to production. I want people to be able to take the code, get clone and run it, and automatically have a database. So there's a new feature in Spring Boot 3.1, which we released in May, to support uh, test containers for development mode. And you can see that when I went to start.spring.io, it automatically created a brand new pu uh, public static void main in my test code, right? This is in the test repository, not the production code. Um, and it's a regular Java configuration class, but it has extra bean definitions for our Postgres database. Okay? So this is only for development mode. So I can run the Spring Boot application from here. And if you're using Gradle or Maven, there's a, there are tasks you can use. So Maven W Spring Boot uh, Test Run, for example. And that's going to spin up Postgres uh, and then automatically connect to it. Now, the... Um, the thing is, I want to also use DevTools. DevTools are great for, re, you know, for iterating over values or for making changes quickly. The basic idea behind DevTools is Java is pretty slow to restart, but Spring is very quick because all it's going to do is recreate the beans. It loads new classes in the class, class loader, and then it recreates the beans. This is really fast, usually, unless you're restarting Postgres every single time. Then it's going to be slow. So I don't want this to be restarted every single time. I'll use an annotation uh, from the Spring DevTools library called at restart scope. That's going to tell Spring Boot that when it does a reload, a live reload of the code, to not restart the Postgres container. Okay? So I'm still in development mode. You can see that this first time when I ran the, the application in development mode, it started up Postgres. It, it actually created a Docker image and started up Postgres for me automatically and it established a connection. Um, and it took a very, very long time 2.92 seconds, right? Exceedingly, achingly excruciatingly long. But now I've got DevTools going and I don't need to do that again. I can just start making changes by recompiling the code. Okay? So let's go ahead and see if that works. Let's uh, Command Shift F9. Okay, I just did a, a small reload. There we go. Um, so that took 1.1 seconds. Let's try again. Let's create a new endpoint here at git mapping customers name collection of customers by name path variable string name, okay? And I'm going to use this. I'll say refined by name, passing that in. There's no method there. 
I'll use the IDE to do the work, take that chat GBT, and then reload. And you can see it's, oh, it's still, oh, it's because I, I have to start DevTools while the, uh, the annotation's annotated with restart scope. Okay, let's try this again. System out, hello. Command shift F9. There you go. Point two five three seconds, right? Literally 10, x, 10, 10 times faster uh, than the original one, right? So now I can make a change, Command Shift F9. Command Shift F9 does recompile, right? Here's recompile, good. So okay, let's go here. Localhost, customers, voila, it worked. Of course it worked, it was a demo. It was always going to work. This is all pretty stock standard stuff, but we haven't stayed still. One of the things that we just announced at the last spring one, way back in, uh, uh, in August of this year, which is um, last month, uh, we announced a brand new project called Spring AI, right? Uh, and so if you go here, Spring Projects Experimental, it's a, it's a new integration with your favorite large language model, okay? Uh, and it's very easy to use. So let's, let's go ahead and pull that into our application. Spring AI, okay? And it's experimental, mind you, uh, just like the language models themselves. Uh, and so we're going to pull this in. Let's see. We need to have this dependency. Okay, here we are. Good. Oh, I forgot the experimental.ai. And we want to this one here. Version. And then of course, we want to this here, right? So pull that in. Voila. And then we need the, uh, the repository here. So I'll add a spring snapshot repository down here. OK, paste, copy. Copy, paste, snapshot, snapshots, snapshots. Is it plural or is it singular? What did I just have? OK, yeah, OK, fine, very good. So now I'm going to reload that, um, or not. It'll just, oh, that's because of this. Oh. Reload that. Now I've got it on the class path. Let's go ahead and restart, test run, because it's, it's a class path change. And now I can actually use that right here, OK? So I can say at controller, at response body, class AI controller, OK? Now in order to use this new AI client that the Spring AI project gives you, uh, you have to configure your, 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 you know, your credentials to, to connect to the LLM of your choice. In this case, I'm using the starter for, for the open AI, OK? So I would say Spring AI, open AI, uh, API key, right? Well, obviously, I've already specified this. I've got an environment variable. I did something like that. I said, you know, export this and all that uh, as an environment variable in my shell. I'm not, I'm not about to leak my open AI key to you, okay? So just trust me that it's there and it's fine. Okay, so I've got this here. And uh, I'm just going to make a, rec I'm, I want a story, okay? I'm going to say, okay, map string, string story time, right? Um, map dot of story, okay? And I'll use the AI client. I'll say, hey, tell me a story about the delicious food in Singapore in the style of famed children's author, Dr. Seuss, another one of my favorite doctors along with Dr. Sire, that's him, okay? <laughs> All right, so we're gonna, we're gonna go ahead and have it tell us a story. So let's go ahead and do that. Maybe I'll put that. I don't know where to put that. Okay, good. Um, Command Shift F9, right? Just reload. Good. Point two. Go back here. Localhost. Story. Okay, and it'll take its time. It's doing its thing. Let's see what it says. This is awkward. It, it, it's smart, but not fast. Um, it's faster than I am, I suppose. That's fair. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wait, am I on the internet? Oh yeah, there we are. Okay, so in a land far away where the sun always shines, there lies a place with amazing food designs. Singapore, it's called a culinary delight with flavors so bold they'll take you to new heights. In this whimsical land where the foodies all gather, there's a tale to be told with rhyme and a blather. 
So sit, sit right down and lend me your ear as I take you on a journey both far and near. In the heart of the city where the streets come alive, there's how hawkers enter where foodies all strive to taste the deliciousness of Singapore's fare with dishes so unique you won't find them anywhere or elsewhere. First, let's start with the chili crab, oh so fine. Spicy and tangy, it'll make your taste buds shine. Served with manto buns? What is that? <laughs> what is that? I gathered, but what's the manto part? What is it? It's like... What does it mean in Chinese? <laughs> bountiful. Bountiful. What? Oh. I, oh yeah, I gathered the I gather the bun part, people. I'm I'm with you on that. I'm just trying to figure out the mantle bit. Okay, that's so bountiful. I like that. Okay, Fei Chong Hao. I'm I'm excited about this. I'm gonna go try it out. So uh, served with mantle buns, fluffy and white. It's a seafood feast. A true. I'm not gonna try it. It's a seafood. I'm allergic. Uh, I should have read the next line. It's a seafood feast, a true culinary delight. Next we have the Hainanese chicken rice, a simple dish, yet it'll make you think twice. The chicken is tender, the rice is so fragrant. Ginger and chili sauce make it truly magnificent. That's a rhyme in a way, I guess. Um, now let's not forget about laksa, my friend, a coconut curry noodle soup that'll make your heart mend. With shrimp, tofu, and fish cake, a spicy broth so grand. It's a bowl of comfort that'll make you feel so grand. Yes, so anyway, you get the idea. The AI is smart, it's really smart. Um, and um, this is text, obviously. This is just a, a, a human language uh, text block. But there's a whole category of engineering that has arisen from these new AI models called prompt engineering. And the whole point is, if you craft, if you craft a prompt, the text that you send to the model, uh, to the AI, if you craft the prompt correctly, you can ask it to give you data in, the, in a data interchange format that your programs can use. Like you can say, hey, do this thing give me the response in the shape of the following JSON schema. And if you don't have an answer, say nothing, right? So now you can actually write code to work with the results as opposed to just, here's a bunch of text. Uh, it's really quite interesting. And there's a, you know, if you, if you can become a prompt engineer, there's a lot of money in it, apparently. So, um, yeah, so that's pretty cool. But, the, but you, did, you notice that when I, when I made that request, it took a long time. It took a long time, and what's happening to our system while we're waiting for that for that response to come what's happening to that thread yeah it's blocked so the AI is smart but we're not look at our code just did something really stupid right uh, so we need to fix that what think about what's happening here uh, we're sitting there in this thread right here we're, we're the res there's a, a request that's gone into our web server and we're gonna produce a response and we're going to produce a response, but we're going to make a call to this other thing. So the time it takes to give that response it was significant. And we're sitting on the thread, and we're unable to move forward. And nobody else in the system is able to use it. Right? This is a problem. Well, there is a solution. It's, it's Project Loom. How many of you have heard about Project Loom? Right? OK, so let's take a brief digression to talk about what that is. OK, we're going to go here. Uh, we're going to use Java 3.2, Java 21. Uh, and uh, Loom. Do I? Oh, Maven, yes. Gazoom. Okay, open this up. UAO Loom.zip. Loom is, Loom is an attempt to make that uh, naive code you wrote in college actually scale, right? And it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's arguably one of the most important features in Java, if not the most important feature. And it opens up new doors. So, what I mean by that is let's, let's just build a very simple. Uh, um, Network service, okay? I'm going to build a very simple network service. Uh, let's see, void serve is throws exception, okay? And I'll create a Spring Bean application runner uh, returns args service, very good. And here I'm going to create a server socket. So new server socket uh, 9090, okay? And what am I going to do? I'm going to say while true except new client. So I'll say var client equals ss.accept, okay? And what, for each, you know, that's going to block. It's going to wait until a new client accepts. And then once I have a client, I want to handle the request. So I'll have a method here, handle, uh, that takes the socket that I've just gotten from the client and does something with it, right? So I'll just, uh, I'll call that method. I'll say handle client, voila, okay? Pretty basic stuff. And inside of this, what will I do? Well, maybe I'll have some sort of logic to uh, accumulate the data. So BAOS equals new byte array uh, output stream. Okay, very good. And then I've got the input stream, right? That's the socket 
dot get input stream. And uh, you know, I want to process, I want to take the data from the input stream. Okay, so try and I'll take this code down here and uh, I'm going to read the data. I'll say file copy utils dot copy from the input stream. So copy input stream to the output stream. Okay, pretty straightforward. Um, and you know, I, you can imagine actually how that code would look. It looks something like this, var negative one while next this is all very simple college level Java 101 kind of stuff, right? Uh, while it does not equal negative one, uh, BAOS dot write next, okay? So I read a byte, I write a byte. Read a byte, write a byte. Get it? Okay, so far. What happens if I'm dealing with a network client and that client's going through a tunnel? Or they're on slow, late Wi-Fi, or they're sending a lot of data? Well, in that read is gonna take a long time to return. And in the meantime, this line doesn't get executed. We say that the thread is blocked, which means that if I have more than one client that's connecting to my server here, then the next client won't be able to get a response until the first one is done. Okay, easy solution. I'll, I'll create a thread, right? Pretty straightforward. So var executor equals executors dot uh, new fixed uh, uh, thread pool. Runtime dot get available processors. There you go. I'm gonna just, for each new thread, I'm going to handle that for each new request. I'll handle it on a different thread. Okay. Good. There's this straight, straightforward, easily, easily understood code. Okay. Now, but the problem with this, unfortunately, is we're still not out of the woods yet. The problem with this is, of course, I'm still blocking the thread. I've just got more threads, but I can't create infinite threads. There, because right now in JDK, you know, in the old days, the distant old days uh, before September 19th, 2023. Uh, we, one thread equaled one operating system thread. It meant two megabytes of RAM associated with each new thread that you created. So realistically, you couldn't create a thousand threads, right? You wouldn't be able to, you'd just run out of RAM first. You'd have a lot more problems besides the actual multi-threaded uh, code itself. So what can I do to sort of improve the situation? Well, I want, to, I want to have some way to know that I'm blocking and then move off that thread until there's something for me to do. Because if I don't have to sit on the thread, then somebody else can reuse that thread. Well, before, we had a way to do this. There's Java NIO, non-blocking IO. You say, hey, I'm interested in these bytes. Here's a callback. Let me know when it's available. And then that was a complete pain in the butt. So then there's NIO2, which is also a pain in the butt. So then my friend, a guy named Tristan Lee over in, in, uh, in, in Korea, he, uh, he created Netty. Right? Netty is a, a much better way to work, but it's still very low level. Nobody wants to write non-blocking I.O. code. It's just a, a terrible way to spend the day. And so we have higher level, uh, higher order paradigms like reactive programming. It's a lot better, but still, wouldn't it be great if this code could work? Why do I have to do the reactive stuff? You might hear people say. Um, and, um, and that's sort of the promise of Project Loom. It'll automatically move the code off of the thread, put it into RAM, make sure that the blocking thing that you're waiting for finishes, and then put the code back on the thread. Okay, and you, if you want to see this in action, it's not that hard. Let's just comment this out, okay? We'll say bean application runner, return new application runner. And we're going to create a bunch of threads. We'll say threads int uh, stream dot range 0 to 100 or whatever, it doesn't matter. Uh, and I'm going to create, for each new index, I'm going to create a brand new virtual thread, okay? Unstarted, and I'll pass in a runnable and I'm gonna turn this into a list, okay? So I've got 100 threads, and then for each thread, for var t threads, I'll, do, I'll start the thread, and then for var t threads, I'm gonna join the thread, okay? So I've got 100 threads, which isn't a lot, but it's enough that I have, I have to share. I can't have true, 100 truly concurrent things. So let's say I do something, okay? Let's say I do um, thread.sleep, 100, and then I want to observe, I want to capture the current thread. I'll observe it, okay? So I'll observed equals new concurrent skip list set of string, okay? And uh, this is going to throw an exception, of course. And I'll say, and I'll have a, a field here. I don't, want to, I don't want to sample all of them. Let's just sample the first one. So I'll say uh, first equals index equals zero, okay? So if it's the first, then observed dot add the current thread dot current thread dot to string, okay? And then I'm gonna do that again, I'll just copy and paste. Here we go, one more time, and then again, and then again, okay? So I've, I've slept a bunch of times, and then after the sleep, 
this is a blocking operation, this sleep, right? I'm sleeping a bunch of times. After the sleep, I'm observing my current thread. I'm just logging it out so that I know what it is. And I'm adding it to a set, so I'll only keep the unique ones. And I'm only sampling one out of the 100 threads, OK? So now we can run the program again. Here we go, run this. Come on. Did, did I print it out? Oh, I didn't print out the observed. OK, here we go. System out, observed. To string, voila, take three. OK, see that? So we can see that in the course of the run, I, ra I, th I slept four different times. The whole time, I was running on the same virtual thread, thread number 33, thread number 33, thread number 33, thread number 33. But each time, I was running on a different carrier thread, a different actual operating system thread it automatically moved it from one thread to another. It's like it wrote a callback behind the scenes in the compiler to run it on a different thread for me after the blocking thing. I used thread.sleep, but inputstream.read is another blocking thing. It'll automatically do the same magic trick. It'll move it to another thread after that blocking thing is finished, allowing you to free up the real thread, the carrier thread, so that something else in the system can use it. This is a huge win. Right? This is a big deal. So this is, a, this is Project Loom. This is virtual threads. This just came out, like I said, a week ago, basically. Uh, yeah, like eight days ago. So I, I, I fully expect they're all already updated and using the new stuff. And if you're not, shame on you. People are judging you. You're embarrassing us. Get it done. If, unless, you hate money, unless you really hate money. In which case, don't bother upgrading. Stay where you are. It's fine. Um, okay, so Project Loom, good stuff. Now, you saw this code. You look at the code I wrote before, my little network server. Um, let me reinstate it. My little network server. Uh, let's, let's hide the old one. Uh, Loom, or whatever, threads. Get rid of that. I've got my little network server down here. And, you know, I want to use, I want to change my network server to take advantage of Project Loom. Well, it's easy enough. I just go here and I change the executor. I say new virtual thread task executor. That's it. Everything else stays exactly the same. The network server, the input stream.read, all that, it's, it's now doing the right thing. It'll automatically move the code to a different thread when it's blocking, when I do client.read. But this is a, it's still, it's very good, very convenient, but there's a lot of places in your typical Spring Boot application where you'll have threads. So do you have to do that? Well, you could, but if you're using Spring Boot 3.2, the new stuff, we'll do it for you. Just enable that. Spring.threads.virtual.enabled, wherever we can. For example, Apache Tomcat, uh, your, your m messaging and integration layer, probably. Uh, all sorts of, where, where else do we do that? I mean, it's just all throughout the stack, basically. I, you know. Async. What? At async. At async, yeah. Like anything where, anything where you might have uh, an auto configured uh, task executor, we'll just plug in the new virtual thread pool. And by the way, it's not a, it's not a thread pool. The, the new virtual task executor doesn't pool, it makes no point to pool. You can create millions of threads now, right? Don't, don't try that on Java 20. But you can create millions of virtual threads today now. They're cheap, they don't cost anything, right? So this is an amazing win. Uh, okay, so we've got Project Loom. Here's my application. It's using Spring Boot 3.2. You kind of understand what's happening here. I'm blocking, but that doesn't mean that my system has to lose scalability. All I gotta do is enable that. Okay, great. So now I've got my application, uh, Command Shift F9, Oop, Command Shift F9, reload. It's up and running. I've got the story. I've got my data. Now, of course, uh, this is a very efficient application, but I'm going to want this to be as efficient as possible. When I was here last time, we talked ever so briefly about GraalVM. Who here remembers GraalVM? Okay, GraalVM is an open JDK distribution that provides support for. Um, you know, it's open JDK, but it has a few extra nice utilities. The most important, the most prominent of which is the native image compiler. And the native image compiler does an analysis on, on your code. It looks at all the code in your class path, and it looks at all the code that that code is using. Uh, and uh, sorry, it looks at all the code that in your main method, and looks at all the code that that code is using. It looks at all the code that that code is using, and so on. It goes down the line, and it finds all the places where you're explicitly using other classes, and it puts all that in a big bag of classes and it keeps those and whatever it doesn't discover it throws away well of course 
this is, a, this is very efficient because you're only keeping the types that your system actually needs to run. The problem is that it misses some things. So for example, if you're doing reflection or serialization or proxies uh, or loading things into the class loader, it's going to miss a lot of that. So you have to tell it about these things, right? You have to tell it not to throw away these types that it thinks you don't need at, during static analysis at compile time. And that's, those are called uh, hints. You have to give it a configuration, right? And I talked to you about this before. You, in order to write that configuration, you have to have a directory full of JSON configuration files, right? You're saying, hey, for reflection, I plan on reflecting on this class. Please keep the metadata associated with this type. Or when I, I plan on creating a JDK proxy for these three interfaces, please keep the metadata associated for that proxy in the heap of the native image. So these, these, this requires a lot of JSON configuration. There's a couple of problems with JSON configuration, this JSON configuration. First, first uh, it just sounds stupid, right? I, I don't like saying the word JSON to, to other adults. I just don't feel serious as a person. It just sounds like a stupid thing to say to somebody. I don't know why we agreed on that name. It just, it just sounds really dumb. Uh, so I think we should change the name, right? Uh, we, we, I'm, I speak French. In French, you'd say JSON which sounds a lot cooler. I'm all about JSON. Yeah, we, oui, exact. And then, uh, and this is cool, there, but I was in Taipei recently, and there they have uh, Jingsong, which means happiness. Uh, and it, I think that would be great too. Either way, I'm done with JSON, okay? Team JSON, here we are. So that's part one. Part two is, there's still a lot of JSON that you have to write. It's very annoying. I don't want to write all that. I, I don't have enough time to do that. I don't even have enough time to finish this talk. Why would I want to, want to write all that? So there's a new AOT engine in Spring Boot uh, 3 that'll do it for us, right? And uh, you can easily use it. You just go here and uh, you do maven p native uh, skip tests native compile, okay? And, uh, you know, probably clean for good measure. What could go wrong? Clean package. Okay, so that's going to, we're just going to let that run in the background. And the problem, of course, is, is it's doing that incredible analysis. It's going through all the code in the code class path and trying to figure out what is being used and what's not and keeping it, right? And it's doing it every single time for all of the dependencies, for all the code in the JDK, for all the code in your code base. It's doing this analysis, and it's taking a lot of time. Look at this memory, by the way. Look at this memory. That's one slack worth of RAM. That's a lot of RAM. That's like one tab in my, my Chrome browser, right? It's obscene. It's obscene. Way too much RAM. So anyway, it's going to take a long time. It does take a long time. And it takes a long time, so long, in fact, that I kind of get, I, it's now to the point where I kind of get bored. I, I sit there waiting for the results. And I, it's like, it takes long enough that I get stuck. I can't move forward. But it doesn't take long enough that I can go do something useful, like take a walk or fire off a, a reply to an email or, or go to the bathroom or make coffee or whatever. Like, it's just very frustrating, you know? And I just get stuck there, hand in head, just sort of waiting for the response, waiting and waiting and waiting. And it's gotten to the point now where I kind of hear uh, elevator music, or I hear theme song music when I do these native Im compilations. I just start humming music because I get bored, right? And, uh, and eventually I just, I said, wouldn't it be great if everybody could hear elevator music? So, so I went to Oracle and I said, Oracle, buddy, please play elevator music during the native image compilation process. And I said, I already hear elevator music in my head while I do these sometimes long running compilations. I just like everybody else to hear it too. Thank you in advance and I appreciate your amazing work. And I do, by the way. I really do appreciate their amazing work. So I went down and then I got some great responses including this one from our friend over at Red Hat, uh, Andrew Din. He's a distinguished engineer on the Red Hat Java team. Open JDK project reviewer, Byteman project lead, and a Growl developer. So clearly, this was a great use of his time. And he said, please, can you make it this elevator music? Now, friends, I'm not going to play this because, you know, copyright. But basically, there it was in the 1990s, uh, a, the first Pierce Brosnan outing as James Bond, which inspired a video game for Nintendo 64, which in turn had a soundtrack. And this is one of the soundtracks from that, from that amazing uh, video game, from that amazing movie. And it's really quite good. So I like the suggestion. A very good choice, Andrew. And then we got another great response here. And it says, uh, this guy, Ivan, he says, I would add that using beeps in general, not only for native image, really helped me to reduce development time. Yeah. 
That's a great idea. My rice cooker makes a ding sound when it's done. Why can't my stupid compiler? It's so obvious to me, right? Like, this is a great idea. Okay, I like the suggestion. And then I got another response, and this one's from Fabio Niepaus. Fabio is another one of my favorite doctors, like Dr. Seuss and like Dr. Sire. Uh, Fabio is a researcher on the Gravium team at Oracle Labs. He's a doctor, and he's, he responded very nicely. He says, thank you for your feature request, Josh. The problems with playing music during the compilation process is that it's just fixing the symptoms, and we've been and are still working on the cause, making Gravium native images more efficient in terms of time, memory, and CPU consumption. Okay, go on. Anyway, he continues, I have prototyped a dash dash Josh Long mode. So here's what that would do. You go, you use the native image compiler, right? And there it says native image dash dash Josh Long mode, hello world. And then it would print out music brought to you by Josh Long. Now this is a picture. <laughs> this is a picture, people. Don't let that stop you from understanding that there's music being played, okay? Take that for granted. There's music. You can't hear it because it's pixels, okay? But imagine. So then you, you can see the, 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 the music brought to you by Josh Long. You're hearing the great music. You're still waiting, though. You still want something nice to look at. So then it would just print out this, right? And this is, I think, what we want, right? This would be, this is what we want, right? So, yes, exactly. I'm sure, I'm sure it'll get merged any day now. So, so anyway, um, I forgot what we were doing. Oh, right. Yeah, okay, the compilation. It did finish eventually. So there it is. Let's run that. Uh, service. Target, all right, voila, service. Let's see, start that. Okay, it failed because, of course, we're using test containers. Uh, and uh, the test containers, you know, it's just automatically done for me during test time. And I didn't specify in my property files, I didn't specify Spring Data Source, URL, JDBC, etc. So I'm going to go to my um, shell here, and I'll go to the desktop. And I've got a Docker Compose file that's going to start up Postgres. I'll say Docker Compose up. Uh, nope, docker ps, docker, uh, let me get rid of all this stuff, rmf, docker ps, docker rmf, docker rmf, uh, postgres, how many postgres do I have? Okay, docker rmf, uh, this one maybe? Okay, docker PS. Okay, good. So now, Docker compose up. We start that. Very good. And now that, that's, now, that, now that I've got that, I'm going to run this script. I'm going to set the environment variables to point to the Docker image that was just created. And I'm going to then run the binary that we, we just compiled. Okay? So very good. There's the application. It started up in 0.118 seconds, right? In about a tenth of a second which is fast. This is a, it's got a full web server, though. So you know, this is not, going, not what you're going to use for Grau VM, uh, for, sorry, for like serverless. You just use Spring Cloud Function, and that'll, that won't bother. It won't bring you the whole uh, uh, Tomcat or whatever. It's going to be fine. But uh, that's not what I care about, actually. What I care about is this. This is the process identifier. So I go get the process identifier, PSORSS, get that. That's the resident set size. That's all the memory loaded into the binary. But it's, it's measured in, in uh, kilobytes. So you divide by 1,000. So basically, that's about 114 megabytes of RAM. right? So now I've got a program that can handle millions of threads. And it takes 100 megs of RAM. right? So why would I use Go again? Why would I use anything besides Java? This is an amazing time to be a Java developer, my friends. It's an amazing, amazing time. Now, we're basically done. Uh, with our little tour today. But I do want to tell you that there is actually a programming model that you can use behind the new AOT engine that allows you at compile time to act on these objects and to programmatically contribute hints to tell it what to keep and what not to keep. You saw in this case that Spring did all the work for you. But sometimes there, it'll happen that you might need to do some work uh, manually, right? And there's a nice component model, and we don't have nearly enough time to go into all of that. But I did want to make it easy for you, so I wrote a little book for you. It's called, um, it's called Everything You Never Wanted to Know About Spring Boot 3 AOT. It's free. You can go download it on tanzu.vmware.com, content, white papers, Spring Boot 3. Uh, and then just put your email in there, right? Uh, and, uh, you know, details. And then you'll get the book. It's like 50 pages. You can read it in the toilet. It's very, very quick. Uh, 
And then if you don't want to read, if you're not one of those reading types, uh, then I made a video for you instead. And that's also, guess what? Yes, that's, it's free. And that's here. Um, it's a two-hour masterpiece uh, on all things AOT in the Spring Boot world. Okay? This opens up a whole bunch of new possibilities. About, it, about two years ago, the good doctor here uh, put together a bunch of the, the JSON configuration to make GraalVM work with the Kubernetes Java client. Right? And then I took that and turned it into the Spring Boot 3 AOT con component model. And then we, we contributed that to the Kubernetes Java client pr uh, project. So believe it or not, clown, a clown though I do seem to look like, I'm actually a Kubernetes contributor. And, 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 and one of the benefits is that now you can write controllers for Kubernetes that take like 50 megs of RAM and handle, un, you know, they have like GoRoutine like scale because of Project Loom, right? This is Java we're talking about. It's just an amazing time to be a Java developer. Um, fr my friends, who learned something new tonight? Great stuff. Who had fun? Great stuff. I thank you so much for hanging out. Uh, we're happy to take questions. Thank you. Oh. Yes. Yeah, it, no, it re replaces the executors. The Spring has its own abstraction called Task Executor, but those usually just wrap executors. So, like from job util concurrent executor, you know. Uh, so yeah, it, we, if we have a bean automatically configured for you, for you know Tomcat, for example, we'll now use a virtual thread pool behind the scenes instead, a virtual Task Executor. Yeah. What was the question? Yeah. 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 If you if you override the defaults in Spring Boot, it'll it'll honor your configuration. Yeah. So I guess the so don't do that. You know, just take take the win. Just delete the code and let Spring do it for you. Uh, next, you in the front, my friend. Yeah. So you said that for Galvium. Yeah. Yep. And we can also specify what classes should be written in addition. So yeah. So how does it handle this clean runtime process, like transactional process, AOT process? Because the exactly. Runtime. Exactly. So uh, the the question there's two kinds of proxies in the Spring universe. There's JDK proxies, and then there's the uh, CGLib proxies, right? Uh, both of them cause trouble uh, for uh, GraalVM. So for the case of JDK proxies. You can actually tell it, hey, I'm going to make a JDK proxy with this interface, this interface, and this interface, and this interface. And we put that in the JSON configuration. And it'll make sure that when you try and create that proxy using an invocation handler uh, at runtime, that it works. It'll write the shim code into the heap so that it will do the right thing. You say, I expect to make a proxy with these three interfaces, or these two interfaces, or whatever, and it'll allow it to work. Um, and so when you, same thing, so if Spring does that behind the scenes, and you've registered that in the JSON, It'll work. Or you can use the Spring component model that I was talking to you about earlier and programmatically do it. And that's nice because it's, it's type safe. It's not so fiddly, right? You don't want uh, strings in a JSON configuration file. Um, when it comes to the CGLib ones, well, there's a bit more sorcery there. But most of the places that that kind of stuff happens, happens in Spring Framework itself. So if you're using the proxy factory uh, uh, builder inside of Spring Framework, right, the, the core of the, the bowels of the framework, a lot of that kind of stuff. If you're using smart instantiating um, bean post processor, is it that one? Yeah, if you're, just using a, if you're using a smart instantiating bean post processor, if you implement these interfaces and you're using these, place, using these things in these well known places, Spring will automatically understand that you've got a, a, a CGLib proxy most of the time. So if you're, most of the time, you're not going to be dealing with those anyway directly. Spring will be doing it for you. But we, we register the hints, is my point. The framework will do it, or you can do it with the uh, programmatic callback API. Does that help? Fine. I need to read more about it. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and like I said, there's a, uh, there's a book and a video with your name on it. Explain why you didn't do your demo in MySQL. Oh, what? Explain why your demo doesn't work with MySQL. Oh, because, I mean, I have a different reason. Why, why didn't I do it? What's the, what am I missing? Because the, the uh, JDC client doesn't work with MySQL. 
You're kidding. Oh, the, so I didn't know that. So MySQL from Oracle, the company that makes the competing database, they're, they're wait, so the company that makes Java and the company that makes MySQL didn't communicate. Okay, so apparently MySQL doesn't work with virtual threads. I didn't know that. That's, uh, that's very awkward. Now, virtual, it's, it's, look, when I say it doesn't work, you've got to remember that when virtual threads don't work, it's like an escalator when it doesn't work. What happens when an escalator doesn't work? You just get stairs. It's still fine. You can just go up the stairs, right? So in the case of virtual threads not working, you just get the same performance as you had before virtual threads with regular threads. It's not like you, it's not like it's going to crash the program. It's just not going to be as scalable, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that's, I didn't know that. That's a pity. But does MariaDB work or is it just MySQL? Oh, well, that's a bummer. I, I haven't used a, so as soon as, as soon, I, I've always been team Postgres, you know, always. And then as soon as Oracle bought MySQL, I was like, <laughs> I'll never have to use this again. Never. And I, and I have never had to use it again. It's been the best 12, 12 13 years of my life. Um, any other questions, comments, feedback, tomatoes, thoughts? Should I, should I go back to the Barbie? So much better. Yeah, you in the back. You say again? Yep. I mean, in general, it's. It doesn't have to be special. They just have to write it. With, right, with. with yeah. So if you're doing. There's a, a few gotchas in virtual threads. Like, if you do input stream.read inside of a synchronized block, then you're dead. You're, you're, you, you cause a problem. So if you. It's not, but when I say it doesn't work in that case, like I said, it just goes back to regular thread performance. Because you end up pinning the thread. You end up pinning the code onto the thread on which it's running. So it just goes back to the Java 20 kind of thread as opposed to virtual. Um, but it's easy enough to get around that. You just don't have synchronized blocks around input stream.read, uh, or you do the input stream.read, and then you do the synchronization, right? Um, uh, so I guess they just haven't done that, that yeah. touch up code. It's not, it, it's, it's not fun, but it's not, uh, it's not like you have to refactor everything. It's just, it should be pretty straightforward to kind of identify these, these um, uh, contentious. Yeah, exactly. Somebody's got to just file a ticket and spend a weekend and go through the code base and find these obvious places. And we, we already ha we had some of that in Spring Framework like five, six years ago. Uh, but when we went, we went into reactive, we went down the reactive rabbit hole. We, we got rid of most of that, in, if, if not all. Yeah, it's all gone, right? So Spring doesn't have any of these um, uh, contentious sort of uh, blocks in the code anymore for years. I didn't know that. This is, I don't use MySQL. There's a reason. Uh, I'm, so, I'm so excited to have another reason not to use it. Anyway, go on. Any other questions? Yes, uh, you in the front. If you hate money, if you hate it, if you really just don't want any of it, don't use virtual threads. Um, uh, there is a little bit of cost. You're right. There's there's thread switching, context switching. So in theory, in theory, uh, the the per transact on something that doesn't block, in theory, if you invoke co the context switching, I mean, it wouldn't do that actually. If you have something that doesn't block, it's not going to switch the thread in the first place. But in theory, there's it could be a little slower per transaction, right? But but again, it's you'll get so many more transactions at the same time now. You know, I don't know. Do your own benchmarking as always, but. Um, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know. The cost, I, I, I haven't found the cost yet. Uh, yeah. I think it's just a really large factor. It's like, instead of a megabyte per thread, it's like 10K or something. <laughs> oh, yeah, so he's just made a great point. Instead of like a megabyte per thread, it's like 10K or something like that. It's, it's not zero. It's not zero, but it's so, it's an order of magnitude less, or many orders of magnitude less, you know? Um, yes, sir, with the yellow shirt. I, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not understanding because there's an like, air conditioning going off and I can barely hear anything. Uh, sorry, I'm speak louder. Uh, now that we have virtual thread that can easily forward it to legacy web servers like you mentioned where Tomcat or anything, do you still think that there is any benefit to using uh, something like a uh, web 
Yes. So, so reactive programming gives me three big benefits, right? One is ease of composition. Two is, uh, you know, let's say scalability, right? The same thing as Loom. And then three, of course, is error handling, right? So what I mean by that is, uh, you know, back pressure and uh, retries and all this kind of stuff when I use a reactor. So this is the thing that most people care about is the, react re the scalability. How many requests can I handle at the same time? And in this regard, they are the same. Loom and Reactive are basically going to give you the same results. Um, but this is still huge. If you're writing, if you're doing service orchestration and composition, if you're doing scatter gather kinds of stuff, then you want Reactive. Trust me. Have you, you know, do you know who Tony Hoare is? Um, forgive me if I'm butchering his name. He's the fella who uh, uh, came up with the $1 billion mistake, right? The null. Null is the $1 billion mistake. But in the 70s, he was talking about also how threads are just a terrible way to do concurrency, right? The way we think of the threads as we have them in Java. It's, a, it's the same basic program model from the last 50 years. Um, and he says it's just not a safe way to do concurrency, right? There's, there, there's only one person who truly knows how to write safe multi-threaded code in Java. And it's not you. That's the point. I don't know who it is. Nobody does. But it's not you, right? That's the point. There are better ways to describe state transitions in a concurrent system than Java Lang thread. Much better ways. Concurrent sequential processes, actors, sagas, uh, you know, um, um, actors, what's the other one? Uh, reactive programming, right? All these things are much safer because they hide or make it so that you have guardrails so you don't get in trouble with concurrent state. Uh, and right now, you don't have none of that. There is a new API coming in Project Loom in future versions, right? They actually delivered just one of three tranches of Project Loom. GA right now is the most important part, which is the virtual threads. But they're also working on um, shared scoped, like a, like a, a more memory efficient uh, thread local, right? Called scoped values. And then they're also going to deliver a uh, a programming model for making it easier to work with threads because again threads are just a great way to point something at your foot that you don't want pointed at it right uh, even if they're and now you've got millions of things pointed at your feet right like it's it's not better definitely not you want the framework to do that stuff for you um, and then error handling reactive programming gives you back pressure it gives you error handling it gives you a way to deal with the realities of distribution and so uh, yeah if you're building a monolith and then, then maybe all you care about is this, right? In which case, yeah, please, go for it. And if you've got existing code and you don't want to refactor, maybe this is enough. It's not like there's no way to handle some of this error handling. You can use Spring Cloud and Spring Retry and the Circuit Breaker Pad, all that stuff. You can add these extra jars and get some of that r r robustness, okay? I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm just saying it's really nice and built in by default with reactive programming. So if you've got existing code, I wouldn't convert it away, but if you've got existing servlet code and JDBC code, yeah, move to Loom and probably fine. You're probably in a good place. And certainly, you'll save money. Thank you. Cheers. Great question. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. Yes, but it's, remember, thread locals create a, an object for every single thread. And now you can have millions of threads. So you can actually run into memory issues where you couldn't realistically do it before, right? Um, that's, what, that's what the scope values thing is all about. And that's not here yet. So <laughs> just be aware. Um, what was the other? Was there another question? Yeah. Can you use M MVC with virtual threads? What? Oh. Not, no. But you don't need to. They're, they give you the same scalability. Yeah. Like if you, in theory, if you're using all servlet async, if you're doing, yeah, right. It's only if you've got blocking code, which is statistically like 90% of the code out there. But if you if you're already doing reactive, there you you gain nothing from virtual threads, which is fine. That's you did the work, you got your scalability five years ahead of time. You're happy. You're in production. Good. Stay there. But the rest of us who have got existing code that's not reactive, eh, this is a big deal. It's good. Free win. Thanks, Java. Any other questions? Yes, sir? So you showed that the method is executed by the same virtual thread. Like different parts of that method can be executed by different runtime yeah. threads. So Continuations. Yeah, so between that, uh, different worker threads, if I, if I happen to call condition between them, 
Is there a, is what? Happens before condition as defined in Java memory model. I don't know. Good question. They didn't change the memory model. Yeah. It did some compiler magic. I don't know. Mine is not to wonder why. I, I, smarter people than I have worked on this. I don't know. I'm sure it's fine. I, like, if, if, if they can't figure it out, then it can't be figured out. Um, I don't know, though. Yeah. Please find out and let me know. Uh, anybody else? Yes, there's, I don't know, the first one in the front and then the one in the back. Yes. Oh, say goodbye to write once, run anywhere, and say hello to scalability. Um, yeah, it's 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 true. You do, but like, and the worst part is you can't do cross compilations, so you can't compile from Mac on Linux and compile for Windows on Mac or whatever. Um, but for example, GitHub Actions, you know, or something like that, they usually have matrix builds, so you can say run the same pipeline on Mac. Windows, ARM, Linux, whatever. That's part one. And then part two is um, if you're using build packs, we have build pack support. If you're using build packs on Linux, on GitHub Actions or something like that, to build your code, it'll actually uh, run the code, if you, or even on your Mac. If you're running uh, build packs on your Mac, it'll run the code inside of a Linux container, right? That's what Docker is. And then that native binary will be a Linux binary, even though you compiled it on the Mac. It'll be an ARM or an Intel Linux binary, so be aware of that. You don't want to try and deploy your ARM Linux binary to a, a x86 uh, Linux server. But yeah, you can kind of cheat that way by having build packs. Since most people are going to Linux eventually, that's probably enough, you know? Yeah, uh, so for example, if I'm going to use like, uh, maybe an ARM stick for another Docker uh, Only for the compilation, yeah. Uh, okay. it's, at runtime, it took 100 megs of memory. Uh, yes, but uh, when I maybe uh, in this case, if I decided to use an emulator, will that 9 gigs of memory be utilized during the compilation? Is it, or it will still have a separate uh, like, uh, build? Like it will sold against those 9 gigs of memory? Uh, I I'm, I'm not understanding, my friend. Yeah. So will it be possible, like, uh, since all the sources are already uh, sorted out, like the names needed, uh, static types or the types? So will it be possible, like, if I decided to jump on and use an emulator of build in that for maybe another uh, architecture or platform? Oh, is it faster? It, what do you mean? I, think the, the, I don't think it's as fast as you can really use. I think the question is, could you speed up the compilation? Because you've already done it once, maybe you could do the other architecture. Oh, I wish. It's yeah. Like a good feature. I don't think they've done it. Though. Yeah. I'm, and there, there. By the way, there's two versions of GraalVM. There's the open source one, the community edition, and the yeah. Oracle one. And they add some cool features there in the the commercial enterprise one first. Uh, and by the way, please go buy that. Like, Java's great. Oracle needs to make some money for it. If that's how they do it, I'm fine with that. Just go, go. You know, especially if it gives you a fast feature or whatever. I don't know, whatever. Um, yeah, what? I don't know. It sounds like the kind of thing they could do. I mean, yeah. Sufficiently motivated. They're smart. They are quite smart. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. That's right. So you what? Regarding uh, the binary size. Yep. So will it include everything like yep. the Yep. So the SR, the JRE, right. the the. JRE, yes. But but actually, very importantly, it only includes what's needed. So from a security posture, you don't have everything in the class path. You have only the things that are being used, which is nice. So everything from the JDK, it's not included. Only the things from the JDK that you use. So those Corbel libraries, although those got removed, but like, you know, uh, whatever. What's a swing. all of Swing? Yeah, that's not in my. The native image doesn't have that code. I couldn't run it even if I, even if I wanted to. But why did you want to replace with like uh, binary size if that's uh, obscene? Yeah, yeah. But I mean, it's already obscene with the JRE version too, so, you know. Any more last question? Well, there's one there. Yeah. Is it possible to use uh, 
Well, JIT compli no, but you can do profile guided optimizations and Oracle or that's a feature in the enterprise one, right? I think they're bringing it to the community. Oh, okay. Uh, Oracle will say that profile guided optimizations are faster than JIT can get to, right? It's a different way of optimizing the code. You do it at runtime and you save it off to a profile and that gets fed into the compilation, I guess. But, uh, but I think it's a feature of the, ex you have to pay. Yeah. That was just in their blog that just came out like last week. You could check that. When the Java 21 support for GraalVM came out, they talked about these numbers. Very interesting. They're, they're saying at the highest peak performance of GraalVM, they're now faster than the JRE at the highest peak for performance for the expensive not you know commercial, not open source one. For some use cases. For some use cases, yeah. A big caveat mtor, big asterisk, whatever. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, which GC is bundled with? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. It's just. Um, let me see. I think it's the standard FS KDK though, right? So yeah. Serial GC, what is that? That's the native output. Garbage collector, serial GC. Eh, there you go. Well, I think that flickering light is telling us it's time to wrap it up. Can we get a selfie? Is that okay? Can we get a selfie together? Okay, Doc, come on. Oh. Oh my God, oh my legs, oh.